Okay. Well, good morning again. This is Dave Donnelly from Reliant. With me is uh, Christy Evans um, and Lori Bass. Uh, uh, the other uh, the other budget coach will uh, could be joining us as well. Uh, so as I said, this is the fifth installment of our webinar series. Uh, today we're going to focus on uh, indirect rates what they are and how to produce those and answer the age old question. What is a good rate? Uh, but first. We like to go through uh, just uh, some informational items. Uh, every Wednesday, the DOE. Hosts their own webinar and it's a lot broader. They talk about they can uh, take budget questions. They take can take uh, any other questions, uh, but that's it. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time tomorrow. Uh, you sh should have got uh, an email with with that link or, or how to register. Uh, we've got 16 days to submittal, so that seems like a lot, but again, that time goes by very, very quickly. Uh, just to be aware, there is a grants.gov website maintenance going on the weekend before the application is due. Uh, so just be aware you won't you won't be or, or there'll be limited access to grants.gov at that time. Uh, I've learned that sometimes on Sundays they'll have it all done and and you can log in on uh, sometime on Sunday. We've had some difficulties with adding participants to grants.gov. I understand there's a workaround that the help desk has. Uh, um, has offered, uh, but for me, uh, and, and it depends on your coach, uh, however they want to do that. But for me, I my backup plan is just when you're ready for me to review your grants.gov application, let's just screen share and uh, we can go through that very quickly. So here's the, uh, the schedule for what's going on next week. <clears throat> So next week, starting Tuesday, we will be holding a four hour sort of open office hour session from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, the first hour will be dedicated to some some topic in depth like we've done here with. With the webinars, but then we'll open it up to Q&A and uh, work sessions with with applicants. For whatever they need so. Um, you have plenty of opportunity if, if for whatever reason we haven't been able to connect. Um, we've got four days, uh, 16 hours to be able to do that. All right, so what are the uh, budget tools that, that we sent you and how do we work together? Uh, in your introductory email, uh, there's a, a link to a questionnaire, an online questionnaire. So please fill that out. That's very, very helpful for us orienting us to what your needs are. Um, there's a how to or a tutorial video link in that email that goes over the basics. Uh, and, and as far as the bas basics go, that's probably the best video to watch versus some of these meeting videos. Um, there is a read me first tab on the budget worksheet. I'll show you the budget worksheet here. Here's the budget worksheet and. Uh, quickly, this simulates your SF 424 form that's in your workspace in grants.gov. It's an Excel version designed to be able. So you can quickly. Uh, input data, change data, and get results from that, those changes, uh, uh, you know, automatically. And there are a number of features within this worksheet that help, help you do that. Quick, I'll go through it really quick. Um, the first two sections are for labor. That's common amongst all agencies when you're pricing anything. Labor always comes first. Um, but in grants.gov, 
it doesn't give you the opportunity or the ability to actually calculate that labor and and the common way of calculating labor is picking an annual salary converting that to an hourly rate and then and deciding how many hours you're going to dedicate to the project so this little labor worksheet is vital for you to get the information that you're going to input into grants.gov. If you, you happen to have a fringe rate, you can input the fringe rate in this box and it'll automatically populate that column that you would populate in grants.gov. Right now, you don't have to have a fringe rate. That's a pricing convention um, used primarily in the academic community, but uh, it's an acceptable pricing method across the board for the government. So your senior and key persons, those identified in your technical narrative that are W-2 employees, they would go here. Uh, section B is for any other personnel that are helping, assisting with the project. And they have their own labor calculator as well off to the side. So pick an annual salary that's fair, even if you're uh, working part time. Pick an annual salary, you can pick those off from if you click on this hyperlink, it takes you to the labor BOE tab. You can pick off then a salary based on government statistics. All right, I know I'm running through through the real quick because I want to get to the indirect rates. All right, so that's labor. Then you get to your non labor project costs. Equipment is a special category of cost that's reserved for what would otherwise be uh, considered capitalized uh, or capital expenses, anything over. Five thousand dollars per unit of items that are, you know, industrial manufacturing machinery type um, uh, test equipment, analytical equipment. Like I said, anything that you would normally or the government would expect you to buy yourself and capitalize it and depreciate it, they're willing to, to a certain extent, uh, subsidize that uh on your budget in your grant it's thousand per month correct so i'm going to mute everyone and if you would like um uh, go ahead and, and send a question through the chat box I'll, I'll stop at the end of this to take some questions um so equipment again if you you can uh well just be aware that if the government does subsidize your equipment list, they will have title of that equipment. Now, you may be able to buy, buy that back from them, or after the project's over, they may shop it around within their agency to see if any, anybody else needs it. So there is a risk that you might lose that equipment. Um, so just be aware of that. Next is travel. Um, and if you click on that cell, it's linked to a worksheet. So you could fill that out. Uh, there is a mandatory PI meeting in Washington, D.C. in October. So uh, you can search for an airfare and you can pick out, pick off the per diem rates for lodging and meals from this GSA website link. All right, so if you fill that out, that automatically populates that cell, which has a corresponding cell in grants.gov in your application. Same with materials and supplies. Uh, we built the little material uh, list, bill of material. Uh, so fill that in. Uh, um, if that would be a good place for if you're buying uh, laptops or CPUs uh, just for the project. To support the project, that's where 
those items would go. A publication cost, you uh, likely won't. If you choose uh, to publish, uh, then you'll be surrendering your SBIR data rights, or you could be surrendering, surrendering some or all of your uh, SBIR data rights that keeps your data uh, from the public for 20 years. Consultant services, that's for subject matter experts uh, and those who may or may not have been identified as a C senior key person in your technical narrative. <clears throat> ADP computer services apl uh, applies to automatic automated data processing or, or uh, any sort of uh, outsourced computing services that you require. Um, then we have two lines for your subaward. One is for the STTR if you have an STTR partner, and the other is for any other subawards uh, where, where you know a good chunk of the uh, R and D is being uh, performed. Uh, equipment and user fil uh, rental fees. If you happen to uh, have access to an incubator. That could be a good good place where you can put any of those rental fees. Alterations and renovations probably won't have consultant services. Uh, the TABA vendor, you need to be aware of what those op options are for TABA, meaning technical and business assistance. You can easily look that up in, in the FOA, but you have one option. If you don't do anything and there's no budget impact and you're selected for award, you'll be put in touch with an outfit called LARTA.org, L-A-R-T-A.org, and they will assist you with uh, commercialization, planning, uh, market planning, things like that. The other option is you can go out and find your own vendor, third-party vendor, and in that case, the DOE is willing to subsidize that for up to $6,500. And if you do select that option, then your grant limit can go up by $6,500. All right. So I know that was a real, real quick run through. Um, uh, I've, I've got a link here for your sub awards. This is very important. Uh, we've done all the math for you as far as, as what the work share should be between the small business and your subcontractors, depending on whether it's an SBIR case, STTR case, or in some cases, we have applicants applying for both SBIR and STTR combined. Um, so we have all those figures uh, figured out for all the different cases. Um, except for fast track, fast track, there's just a handful of uh, applicants we're helping with fast track, and that's that's a special case. All right. So those are all your direct project costs. They all get summarized in your application form. Then it's a matter of magically. Selecting a uh, indirect rate, and uh, for what we've given you as far as the worksheet, uh, we just we've given you a placeholder. All these numbers are placeholders. The twenty-five percent indirect rate is a placeholder, um, and what's that? What that's designed to do is provide enough funding for you to administratively manage the firm over the course of the project. And if you have more than one project, this is this grant's contribution to your administrative cost pool. I'll get into that a little bit more. So you add both the, the indirect and direct cost up, then you apply a fee, the max is 7%. Uh, it should not be zero. Uh, neither the indirect cost rate or the fee should be zero. You should have something in there for those. 
then at the end that yields your total grant amount and uh, your job is to get up to but not over the grant limit with or without TABA. So that's a quick tour through the budget worksheet. The other form you'll need to be aware of. I can pull it over here. Is the budget justification form. This is the narrative and this is the DOE form, the narrative that goes along with the budget. So you do the math problem. Now it's an English assignment. We've put in text boxes with our instructions or our hints on how to fill this out. Okay. So best practice would be get your budget where it's stable or static. It's not going to change anymore, right? Then start filling out your budget justification form because if you fill out this form and your budget changes, then you, you have an extra step of having to reconcile all these numbers again, make sure, you know, figure out which ones have changed and make those changes. But you'll see that every category of cost, there's a number of prompts. And when they say briefly, they, they mean briefly, right? They don't just uh, quick and to the point uh, in answering these prompts. All right. So they go through all the project cost, and then at the end, they have a little discussion about indirect costs. Uh, we've again supplied some hints here, uh, but we can certainly help you out with this section. They'll ask if you uh, if, if your rates have not been approved by any federal agency to provide uh, supporting documents. That can be deferred until notice of award, and in fact, you can. You can put that note as a response to this paragraph three. Or um, you'll see on the budget worksheet that we have a little metric down here at the bottom that suggests if, if this metric is under 50%, then no documentation is required to back up whatever indirect rate you choose, which is nice. It's sort of a safe harbor. <clears throat> OK, so that's the budget justification form. Right, before I get into the indirect rates. What other questions might you have? Uh, let's see, Christy. I yeah, what's that? I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, any, anything come up that um, needs to be addressed? Nope, I'm answering all of them. OK. Perfect. And if anybody wanted wants to chime in right now, you can. I have mute, uh, muted everyone, but uh, you can unmute yourself and, and ask the question if you like. Otherwise, I'll jump into indirect rates. Let's see. Well, let let me just first go through my slides. So. First steps, really read the FOA. Uh, it, it's easy to word search through it if you get stuck on something or ask us. Um, uh, Signing up with grants.gov, hopefully uh, you've gone through that and you're able to find your application um, and then our resources. So this is what your application should look like in grants.gov and the second form down is the budget form which um, you know you'll probably want to input using the web form the GUI interface so that's where all the budget information will go your uh, budget justification form would be added to that form there's a place to add that now, if you have um, a subaward, you'll 
see that this subaward budget isn't highlighted. Okay, it isn't activated. And so to activate that, that's a simple process of just checking the box. It'll activate. I go to subforms. You ask um, to do a new subform. Just put in the name of your subcontractor, and then you'll see that it produces a hyperlink to that budget. So down that, download that budget as a PDF or give them access to the web form. All right, so we went through the budget details. We've looked at the budget justification form. Oh, right, um, the LOE worksheet. This is the DOE's form that scores your work share and make make sure that it makes sure that you're meeting your work share requirements, whether it's an SBIR or STTR. It's a pretty neat form, pretty smart form. So you can select what you're applying for. Um, you can uh, a lot of this data is already uh, bring uh, bring brought over from the budget that you fill out. So we've linked this form to the budget. And then the smart form uh, does some of these calculations and says whether you've uh, met the criteria or not. So that's pretty slick. This will need to be PDF'd and let's the it, uh, we'll let you know where where this goes in your application. All right. All right. The indirect rate calculator. Um, so with that, what we prefer is, uh, and, unless you're experienced with uh, calculating indirect rates, uh, we would like to operate that model initially using uh, your budget that you filled out. So, um, and then we'll we'll share that file with you and and discuss the results uh, but again the delivery of that model uh, to the doe can either be waived uh, in the case that uh, you're under that 50 percent metric we talked about or it can be deferred until after notice of award so the takeaway there is you don't have to submit this with your application now it can be deferred until notice of award because really knowing no one's going to look at it um, during the technical review. All right. There's a part of the federal acquisition regulations that goes into what a design of the indirect rate should be, what the rules are, what the guidelines are, um, and it's a it's a big word problem, uh, but. It allows you a whole lot of flexibility in producing indirect rates. So uh, bearing in mind that uh, the total cost of contract is both your direct and your indirect expenses. Uh, um, as long as those indirect expenses are equitably and consistently applied across all your jobs. So what does that mean? Well, before we get into the details, there's a number of factors we take in uh, as far as how to design it, both an indirect rate structure and the level of indirect rates, how much they are. So one is business size. Obviously, if you're a small business, your needs are, are, are a little different than Raytheon or Boeing or somebody like that. Um, Number of contracts is a factor, and what type what type of contracts they are, uh, type of business you are, whether you're a manufacturing business, uh, making widgets or uh, services or R and D, that plays into um, the indirect rate formation. Uh, a lot of times, it depends on the agency. Uh, or your customer, your your lead customer, uh, they may have practices uh, 
and uh, nuances for indirect rates that other agencies don't have. Uh, so it could be agency specific. Um, uh, you'll have a mix of, uh, whether you have a mix of commercial and government business and, and what that mixture looks like as far as your project costs. And a big part of that is, you know, do you have subcontractors? Uh, do you have a, a, a supply chain that you need to manage? So those are those are some of the factors. So the rule of thumb is to try and keep it as simple as possible for your particular situation. And that's that rule of thumb. That's really what the rule of thumb means is. Uh, like the old saying goes, uh, keep it simple, stupid, right? All right, so. What's a good rate? A good rate is if you're a pirate like me, it's uh, as high as the customer is willing willing to pay. So bearing in mind that the government is very generous about what they're willing to pay for as far as general business expenses in the form of fringe, which could be a uh, salary for paid time off, any bonuses, payroll taxes, medical insurance premiums. Um, I don't have it in here, but it's uh, 401k, a retirement account uh, contribution. So you get the idea and the sense I get is the government. Is fine with with fringe benefits, they they really don't have an objection. To uh, any level of fringe benefits. Uh, operating costs, those are your fixed cost or uh, which would include rent, utilities, phones. Um, you know, whatever else that that is a common monthly expense for you to run your business. <clears throat> now, I think uh, just as important, especially for R&D type companies is, you know, your technical infrastructure, both from an IT point of view or, you know, whatever special needs you might have, uh, assets you might have to procure and depreciate uh, or expenses, other expenses, to really improve your your capabilities, your technical capabilities, and and, and your technical skills. Um, also important is uh, the outreach, the, trying to find customers either through marketing, business development, uh, proposal pr preparation, which has been proposal activity. So again, uh, you know, open your eyes to the generosity of the government in paying normal business expenses. So another factor in deciding what a good rate rate is, is really where you are in the competitive environment. Uh, do you compete on cost? If you compete on cost, then, then designing an indirect rate structure and indirect rate levels becomes uh, pretty critical uh, because your competitor is trying to be as lean as possible so they can uh, win based on cost. Uh, but for an SBIR company or an R&D company in, in this SBIR space in particular, you're not competing on cost per se. You're competing on, on and you'll win on the technical merits of your proposal. And, you know, the budget is really an afterthought. Not to diminish it, but um, that's that's sort of the fact. Uh, you're not competing on cost. Everybody gets the same amount. All right. So it's really up to you to balance. Well, what are my business needs versus what do I need to get this project done um, to impress the government? All right. So that's sort of the the SBIR contracting and grant conundrum. Is you're not competing on cost. Um, now, if you're in the commercial environment, uh, you have a little bit of leeway there too. Again, depending on your competition, uh, you, if you don't have a lot of competition, then you know your margins can go higher, your rates can go higher. Uh, but in this SBIR and government contracting environment, 
um, like I said, I think you can be as aspirational as you can with your indirect rates. Well, OK, so blah, blah. What does all this mean? Um, Let's just again take we're just taking uh, broad strokes here before we get, get into the details for 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 professional services. Uh, your typical. Wrap uh, or uh, uplift on labor is 2.0, meaning where every dollar of labor. Uh, your indirect comes along as another dollar. But that's pretty low. That wouldn't be true. Well, now I have to think about this. <laughs> um, yeah, with the labor uh, wrap of 2.0. So that would mean your labor is fully burdened with a fringe and with uh, any other cost. I think for a professional services firm, that's probably uh, high. I've seen it down uh, around 1.5, 1.4, because that's a very um, competitive space, professional services. Now, if you're a widget maker, your labor wrap, would be much higher than 2.0 because you have a lot of uh, support from uh, you know uh, if you're manufacturing a floor um, you have a lot of management support you have a lot of uh, production support quality uh, quality control support so that labor rat at least the touch labor <laughs> wrap is is much higher with r d uh, you're probably somewhere in the middle. But again, with R&D, you can leverage those rates to meet your business needs, whatever they are. OK, so with that type of information, let's look at the indirect rate model. So this is the indirect rate model that we've given you in your one one drive folder. Uh, just a quick look at the instructions. Uh, uh, you can read through those, but the assumptions are, are, are important. What we're assuming is <clears throat> all your phase one costs are within uh, the fiscal year 2023, just for computational services uh, purposes. You know, it may not be true, but let's just say that that's how we're going to calculate our rate. Um, plus, not only uh, do you calculate using all your um, phase one job costs, but you have, if you have any other revenue generating jobs within 2023, we'll need to know what that is as well, because your rates are calculated on an annual period and for the entire operation, not, not just one job, all right? So the input tab is where your data would initially be input in calculating uh, your indirect rate. Uh, it can be as basic as collecting all your project costs, otherwise known as direct cost. That's, that's a term of art, direct cost. And then collecting all your indirect expenses. That's everything that's not project related that you need to run your business. So how do we how do we get those figures? Well, let's you know I've defined an indirect uh, cost um, or the way it operates is the government uh, doesn't expect you, for example, to uh, get your rent bill and then try and allocate that rent somehow over all the jobs you have. That's not the expectation. Um, the exception to that is labor. Now, labor, they do want you to keep track of a little more closely because of the nature of labor. So with labor, not only do you 
uh, we have a labor calculator here in the indirect rate model. The purpose for that is to calculate not only the labor for your specific SBIR job, but also um, estimate what, if you have other jobs, how many hours individuals are going to dedicate to those jobs. Because again, a rate is calculated on the entire cost of your operations for a year. Bear in mind, your indirect rates can also pay for when you're not working on a job, it can pay for things like uh, engineering activities, engineering design activities, in general, marketing and sales, uh, just plain vanilla ad administration bid proposal, and you can fund indirect, um, independent, independently funded research and development, or internally funded, um, and also pay time off. Let's just put some numbers in there. So as you put in your hours, this model automatically converts that to dollars. And these dollars then will flow over into this column D. So first, what we'll do is we'll, we'll ask you about your business, what other projects you have um, besides this one. We'll, we'll input the figures for yours. Um, well, and for the project, we'll also fill in what those non-labor expenses are. And if you happen to have non-labor expenses for some of these others, you can put those in. All right. All that job cost data, including labor, then flows into the direct cost or project cost of the model. All right, they all get aggregated, okay? Then the fun part starts. This is where you can then estimate what indirect expenses, what business, common business expenses, you can ask the government to pay for. Uh, we've already calculated, if you, you have W-2 employees, we've already calculated for you what the employer half of uh, the payroll taxes are. Um, I've just put in placeholders for subsidizing medical insurance premiums, uh, co contributing to a uh, employee's retirement plan. Uh, the pay time off comes over automatically or it's linked to from your labor calculator. And so you'll see we, we start what we like to call this is a pool. We start pooling up expenses that are real similar. So in this case, this is the this is the fringe benefits pool. We also have what we call a facilities pool. And again, you can go shopping here. Uh, what are you depreciating? Any uh, leased equipment or furniture? Insurance. It goes it goes on on and on. Uh, rent. Um, so these are your fixed costs. They're they're pooled up as a faci facilities cost. Engineering indirect, that's a more of a specialized area. Uh, you could have labor in here, uh, you may not, but if you have a lab, if you're outfitting a lab, you certainly can have uh, outfit that and be reimbursed for that through your indirect rate. Then we have marketing and sales, where you may go to conferences, There'll be travel, administrative, uh, accounting, uh, again, conferences, consultants, uh, legal fees, you know, all the common expenses you might, uh, uh, that might occur for your business. A bid proposal activity, um, independent research and development. So all those expenses, remember that's different than 
your project expenses. All your indirect expenses are then collected. In this case. In, in your indirect cost pool. And then your base, so it, it, the base. Well, the term of art here is your indirect cost is your pool, which would be the numerator in calculating your indirect rate. All your direct costs or project costs is called your base, the denominator. And that derives your indirect rate. And that derives an indirect rate if you were just using a single indirect rate system. All right. And then we have some job cost calculators down here just to demonstrate that, uh, you know, with all these jobs that you're doing, you are collecting, you're, you're applying that GNA, or is it? Yeah, you're, you're applying the GNA to each one of those projects based on the total, based on the base or your project cost. And to prove that, hopefully it proves out that with your total cost of all your projects, it accounts for all, all your costs. So that the concept behind indirect rates is calculating an indirect rate that's fair, that you think is fair for you and for your business, and then allocating that indirect rate across all your jobs. So well, let's see, that's 50K, 5862. So all these jobs, we use the, the term absorb their fair share of that indirect rate of that 50K. Okay, you see that happening? All right. With that data set, uh, you know, you can calculate an indirect rate. We call that uh, total cost input the way we've calculated it here, meaning it, that rate's being applied to all your job costs. There's other ways to calculate your indirect rate. You could say, well, I want to pass through materials and subcontracts without applying an indirect rate. So that would mean your base would be less, your denominator would be less, your numerator or your indirect cost pools remains the same. So when that occurs, obviously your, your indirect rate goes up when your base goes down. Right. And then if you're just applying it to labor only, your rate to labor only, you're passing through all your non labor project costs without a GNA or an indirect rate, then your rate looks high, but again, you're only applying it to your labor. So those are two examples of what you could do with your base to get a different uh, indirect rate. Now, say you 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 were either uh, you, you may have got in the practice of having two rates: one being a standalone fringe rate. And then uh, an indirect rate on top of that. So we have a tab that links to all the data you input, and it will automatically calculate your fringe rate and your indirect rate, which is equivalent to what you calculated as a single rate. In the same manner, we've calculated a, two, a classic, what I call a classic uh, two rate, uh, DOD two rate, where now 
you have a rate expressed as a total overhead rate, which is based on labor or applied to labor. And then GNA rate that's applied to labor plus overhead plus all your other project costs. And again, we can uh, uh, adjust the base and get different results. And if we get real complicated, then you can go with a three rate system where again, you have fringe rate as a direct cost, overhead and GNA. Again, all pulled from that, that same data, all totally equivalent, but we're just using different techniques for applying those indirect rates. So I think for us, uh, for most uh, applicants, we want to keep it simple, right? <laughs> so uh, I think a single rate has a utility, uh, probably and we have clients who um, have been using a single rate for years. Um, and unless there's, there's something that changes that, uh, either going with a different agency or, or whatever else, um, you know, you you're fine just with the uh, indirect rate. Now, if you're used to the, uh, a lot of folks are used to the academic approach where you have fringe as a direct rate. That's fine too. That's fine too. And if that were the case, then uh, on your your budget worksheet, you would make sure that. You're then filling out a fringe percentage when you're calculating your budget. All right, so that's indirect rates in a nutshell. Any questions on that? So to reiterate, we will, will fill this out initially for you. Uh, we'll put in the labor that you have um, for your application. We'll ask you if there's any other work going through and estimate how much that is. And we'll populate that. We'll probably just put in some random numbers like I have here. And then we'll give it to you and, you know, you can move those numbers around to wherever you'd like, whatever level you'd like. Uh, and then, you know, if we chose a, a rate of 25%, as a placeholder, and you're over that, then it's just a matter of then going back through and and cutting things. Or if you're you're under 25%, then you can add more more costs in your indirects. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful and at least getting you oriented on on the purpose of indirect rates. Really, and for SBIR firms. Uh, it's a great uh, bootstrapping mechanism where you can use that indirect rate and those expenses to do the things you need to do to, uh, you know, find new business, find new opportunities for your technology, um, and, you know, uh, work on proposals. All right, so let's go back to the. Right, so best practices for indirect rates is to develop an annual uh, budget. Uh, you know, an annual forecast. And then uh, if you can manage to those budgets, sometimes that's difficult in the SBIR small business environment. You never know when. Um, Grants or contracts are, are going to be awarded sometimes uh, or how many might be awarded. So do your best to manage the budget. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, manage your budget so uh, you either don't go over your stated indirect rate um, or if you do, uh, you know, there and definitely don't drastically underrun that indirect rate because that just means you're leaving money on the table, uh, money that you could use for your business. Um, and, you know, uh, 
try and get as close as you can um, annually on, on on what your budgeted rate is is really uh, the purpose uh, because if, if there's wild swings that that causes a headache in uh, you know when it comes to the, the program ending and understanding how much you might owe the government or how much they might owe you due to that, that fluctuation of indirect rates. So that would be, uh, you know, a continuous evaluation of your cost um, or a periodic evaluation of your cost and your indirect rate throughout the year. And not only your rate, but if your rate structure is still appropriate and, you know, how your competitive environment has changed. All right, so common errors to avoid uh, when filling out your budget or putting your budget together. Uh, administrative costs are not uh, project costs. Those, uh, as you just saw, would be collected in your indirect rate. Uh, we see sometimes we'll see common material on the equipment budget line. Again, that's that equipment budget line is reserved for special uh, costs or what would otherwise be capitalized equipment. Uh, you should have uh, a labor rate that's fair. Uh, you, you, you don't want to discount your labor rate uh, because if you get into phase two and you bump up that labor rate, there may be some resistance and scrutiny applied to that. I haven't really seen a labor rate too high. Um, yet but again uh, it'll be scrutinized and you'll have to defend that uh, for a rate uh, you select typically you know, you'll have to have some justification for it um, you'll you'll have to have travel for the PI meeting uh, I know in the past um, they've held that virtually because of COVID but I think we're over that um, you should have an indirect rate and you should have a fee. Uh, and as far as your subaward budget goes, you know, don't try and allocate their cost into your budget. Their cost is a single cost, and it comes in as a one liner, one liner into your budget. All right, so those are those reminders. Uh, another quick re reminder is our. It's not a, a formal warranty, but uh, uh, you know we may prefer to uh, defer completing some documents. For example, your indirect rate calculator, if you don't need it, uh, or if some for some reason we run out of time and uh, we can't get to the indirect rate calculator since it's not uh, required uh, with the application. Uh, if you need it for later, we can calculate that for later. Uh, we can assist with, uh, uh, if you are chosen for award, we can assist with fact finding and negotiations within reason, <laughs> pro bono, uh, because they usually go by, uh, they go quick, you, you'll need, uh, you'll have questions on, you know, terminology and, and uh, things like that, um, uh, but we should be able to to quickly and effectively um, address any any fact finding or negotiation question coming from the DOE concerning the budget. Uh, as well, we can answer some operational questions. I mean, post award, uh, you'll have you'll have a lot of questions. Uh, and again, within reason, we can assist or guide you uh, for any future budget rounds. Uh, whether it's with DOE or or with NSF, NIH, or or the DoD or USDA for that matter, uh, again within reason uh, until you know if it gets too too much, then uh, we'll ask to get paid. All right, so any questions? That are lingering, and as as you think about that, 
these are some of the riddles we've put together for these seminars, for these webinars. Um, there are no questions currently in the chat. Uh, so if anybody has any like ones they want to ask over the uh, phone, go ahead. Um, there is one thing about uh, someone needs help finding the application in grants.gov and I don't quite know how to help them on that. It might be need to be a separate call for that. Well, yeah, you know. Um, other than Lori, none of us have had the pleasure or the benefit of actually being an applicant in grants.gov. Plus, uh, they, they seem to have changed how you do that. So we're not the experts in grants.gov. Uh, if you're having trouble, uh, you can uh, access the help desk. From what I've been told, they, they're they very responsive and very helpful. So don't be shy about that. I, it's not your typical help desk from, from what I gather. They are really helpful. Okay, so I'll give you the, the answer to this week's riddle, as if you didn't know that already. But ho hopefully we've done our job to help you understand a little bit more of the uh, dart and science behind indirect rates, as well as putting the budget together. All right, I'll give you another minute for uh, any more questions, uh, and if not, I'll go ahead and sign off. I think I'll go ahead and stop recording.